All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the Well of Being here at the Dharma Collective. Wonderful to be here with you all. Um, friends here and friends online. We are continuing to work our way through this beautiful text by Shanti Deva with the commentary also by Pema Chodron. And just as kind of a reminder for folks who have been coming and or if it's your first time and or if you just forget every time, which is totally reasonable given how full our weeks are, this book has three main parts. And you know, the first part is really considered kind of preparing the ground. And we are almost complete with this first part by starting chapter three today. And the preparing the ground thus far, it's been a way to help us feel inspired by this opportunity to become compassion warriors in this lifetime, kind of giving us all the reasons why bodhicitta is the only sane thing to do with our life, to dedicate ourselves to other beings is actually not this um, exclusively self-sacrificial approach, but the key to our happiness. Then, you know, another part of this text and, and way that we <clears throat> move through the first part of these teachings together is we did this kind of recognition and, and understanding of how we can offer up what we enjoy, how we can offer up what's beautiful, and what an interesting practice that can be in terms of, again, preparing the heart and the mind to really be available to other beings. And another piece that we were working on the last couple of weeks was confession. I um, you know some of us in this room were here for that. And yeah, what an interesting <laughs> opportunity to look closely at the ways our aversion, like not wanting things to be a certain way and our clinging, wanting things to be a different way, like gets in the way all the time. And like all these little ways, right? Like just the, that kind of daily grasping and aversion and the confession piece really being grounded in a sense of these behaviors or these reactions, they aren't me, right? They're not me, but I can see them clearly. I can figure out a way to maybe remedy them and I can find this sense of real like resolve or desire uh, for them to shift and change. And tonight we move into this, this beautiful chapter. Um, there's quite a lot of material in it, so I don't know if we'll get through all of it today, but it is the chapter where we, we hear um, you know, the, the true vows of the Bodhisattva. So if the Bodhisattva is a warrior of compassion, it's a way of living. And part of that way of living is kind of dedicating ourselves to these practices on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, this word of taking vows doesn't sound that appealing and sexy to most of us, right? Like taking vows, wow, that sounds, you know, like, why do I need to go that far? But when you hear these vows, they are just like piercingly beautiful, right? They are these vows of how do I intend to show up for all beings in a way that's pure compassion. So very, very beautiful. And um, yeah, so I think we will get to the vows, but the way that we start um, in this chapter is, is looking you know, a bit more at rejoicing, um, which is interesting, and then kind of how we start developing this aspiration of teach of receiving teachings and then dedicating the merit. So dedicating the merit, many meditation teachers, meditation sessions, at the end, we do a dedication of the merit. But in this chapter, it really unpacks how beautiful it is to dedicate merit and that the kind of essence of it is a complete letting go a complete letting go. And there's no way to actually experience, um, you know, liberation or nirvana unless we can really have that sense on a moment to moment basis and then overall of letting go. So that's what merit is all about. So hopefully we'll get there. And in this text overall, as many of you have been tracking, there's these two main components. So we want to wake up for the sake of all beings, dedicate ourselves to be compassion warriors. We have to both kind of train the mind in 
this kind of flexible wisdom, this clear seeing. And those practices often involve us directing our attention in one place, sustaining our attention in one place, finding spacious awareness. And then they also include the cultivation of compassion, right, more directly and deliberately. And so last week we, you know, you know kind of moving more towards that deliberate cultivation of compassion. And tonight we're going to do that deliberate development of compassion as well. And I want to say a couple words about that, and then we will practice, go through this text together, um, and hopefully intrigue and excitement from there. But this practice of the cultivation of compassion, especially through Tonglen, so many of you may be familiar with that term. I had the good fortune to teach for Vinnie Ferraro on Friday, and I did a, a session um, for his online group just on Tonglen. And I, I know it's a powerful practice, but I was kind of blown away how deeply it touched people. Um, I think you were there, Jimmy, right? It was pretty profound, you know, really opened up a lot of heart space for folks. Um, just this opportunity to really first find ourselves embodying and inhabiting a body of compassion. So the way that Tonglen is traditionally taught is you flash on emptiness. That's like the, one of the first steps. But for many people that can feel quite abstract and unfamiliar. So why would we flash on emptiness before we then offer our heart of compassion? It's like, a, can be a bit unintuitive. And my understanding <clears throat> of that is when we're flashing on emptiness, we're actually able to see that like all suffering and all compassion you know, they are always in some ways intertwined. Like there is an ongoing stream of suffering and difficulty and challenges. And it's actually very hard for us in our limited understanding and our limited time frame of how we see the world to see that actually suffering is always changing, especially if it's for someone we love or ourselves, right? Like if we have a toothache or a belly ache or we're in pain, it's very hard to say like, oh, this will pass. I'm good, no problem. And if someone we love is like experiencing mental illness or lost their job or you know going through a horrible breakup, it's kind of hard for us to have that larger view. And as we've talked about a bit here, there's this beautiful space where emptiness and compassion kind of coexist. Emptiness isn't just this void or this abyss. Emptiness is there's so much space that everything can arise, but that space isn't neutral. That space is love and compassion. And so what I understand of how do we, you know, engage in this Tonglen practice, which I think is the closest approximation to, you know, what's the one um, territory or the one deliberate practice of becoming a bodhisattva, probably Tonglen. Like it's such a direct invitation to take on another suffering, to transform it at your own heart and to extend that. It goes so against the grain of how we usually meet suffering, which is like, no thanks, right? It's that like directly turning towards and taking on and not taking on as in, I'm gonna fix this for you. I'm gonna change it for you. I'm gonna make it better. But like, I am gonna be here with this because I recognize I have this view of emptiness or this view of compassion that's so great, anything can arise and pass within it. So that like flashing on emptiness gives us this opportunity to see the big view. Um, I gotta make a plug. I listened to one of the best podcasts I've ever heard yesterday. I know it's a big claim and you know, whatever. I forget a lot of things. So there's probably been other good ones, but uh, RuPaul was interviewed by Dan Harris. Did anybody listen to that? Oh my God. I know that RuPaul is a practicing Buddhist and you know, I've heard some, you know, snippets, but there was so many um, drops of wisdom. So I just highly recommend that 10% happier for free. And one of the things uh, RuPaul mentioned was the technology they describe, like the metaphor that works very well for them is imagining like a Google Earth view of their experience. And in some ways, flashing on emptiness is like clicking out, clicking out, clicking out, like, whoa, I see the city, I see the planet. Ah, right. 
it's actually clear seeing. Our pain or the pain of the people that we care about, there's like none of that perspective. We're so in it. So in order for us to do the exchange of inviting their suffering, some part of us has to have that bigger view at the same time. I'd say one of the most common questions I get over and over and over and over teaching compassion is like, what's that? What's the stance of not getting lost in the other person's suffering? Like, I don't understand compassion because I don't want to get lost in another person's suffering. And I think this idea that like part of you, you know, part of you has this, um, like you're open to the dimension of the expansive behind you even as you're facing directly towards the suffering. So like part of you is kind of like being held by something much bigger so that your heart can extend. That's just a lot of words, but I, I hope it's like a, that's the frame. And so when we enter in this Tonglen, I'm gonna invite us to kind of hold ourselves in a bigger understanding of compassion before we engage in this truly heroic activity of turning towards another suffering with the intention that we lighten their load. We take some of their burden. It's symbolic, but you know, symbolic is real, right? I mean, the stresses in our head that keep us up all night, they're not happening right now. Like they're symbolic, but they are real, right? So we're taking on into our mental space, this um, desire to hold the suffering of another and then we are recognizing that kind of bigger view, compassion and emptiness, and this unbelievably powerful heart that we have. There's kind of a little bit of a leap of faith there that that heart can transform this suffering. So that's the, the visualization. And, you know, I, I often speak about this, but I, I think visualization is a very underutilized tool in our meditation toolbox. And strengthening it not only helps our attentional practice, helps us focus, it really is a way to decenter. So instead of the, the difficulty or suffering of the world, maybe feeling like it's stuck in our mind, in our, in our heart, we're like giving a little decentering so it can exist outside of us. And in that way, we have some space to work with it. Fasten your Tonglen seatbelts. Yes. Um, when you're saying flashing on emptiness, you're saying have a bigger view of just. And I'm 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 going to do like a little different version of it. Um, the way I like to flash on emptiness is to recognize all the compassion that we've ever experienced in this life, and all the compassion we've ever extended in this life. Just to you know to be like, oh wow, it's not just right now. Like there is, and then, you know, even all the compassion we may in the future, like it's just unfathomable, unknowable amount of compassion. So instead of like, what do I have available today? Like I had a coffee, I got my exercise, but I didn't sleep well. So I have like a little bit, right? Like imagining it as just much bigger than what we feel in this moment in kind of our more small mind. And you hear Pema Chodron throughout the book, like she says, the essence of like Chogyam Trumpa's teaching, her teacher is think bigger. Like a simple pit, like think bigger. So we're going to kind of think bigger with our compassion before we invite the suffering of another. So it can be helpful to think, is there a person or a place in the world you'd like to practice for today? Um, we're going to practice for ourselves first, and then we are going to practice for another being or place or beings. So go ahead and find a comfortable posture for yourself.
And taking a moment to really settle into the posture, finding that uprightness of the spine, not an uprightness that also feels supple, not too rigid, almost as though there's an energy coming from the base that just lifts us up through the spine, through the top of the head. Also finding that sense of openness or porousness through the front of the body. So much of our meditation practice is, can we experience and touch into openness, tenderness, just what's here and present. So feel or imagine that a bit of whatever armor might be needed to move through the world could soften. We can more fully inhabit this beautiful, tender human heart and body. And as we hear the bell, using it as an invitation to really fill this posture, that vividness and uprightness, that tenderness and openness. as an invitation to help us more fully arrive and leave whatever we don't need in this moment just outside the door. We can connect to this very simple and very beautiful practice of bodhicitta. This aspiration to open our heart for the sake of all beings. Remembering this meditation is not just for us. It absolutely can help us. It's such a different sense and quality when we recognize what we are doing this for. The only way to move towards sanity in this completely insane world starts right here, this breath. Gently connecting to the feeling of this body being supported.
feeling the body from within the body. And allowing the mind to rest and noticing sensations with clarity and precision. With how much resolution can you experience the multitude of sensations in the body? while still recognizing and anchoring our attention, the sensations in the body. We can narrow and deepen the focus to include the breath. Feeling the sensations of this body as it breathes in. Feeling and knowing the sensations of the body as it breathes out. What if we could find this simple practice, feeling and sensing the body breathing, as profound and beautiful as a starry night sky, and finding the richness and beauty, deeply knowing, feeling, sensing this breathing body. Doesn't matter how many times you get distracted. Feel the freshness of returning. Keep coming back. As we move towards the Tonglen practice, 
and continue a focus with the body, but also imagination and memory. Considering and feeling into the body as a body quite literally made up of compassion. Considering the compassion that allowed us to make it through our early years, develop, grow, strengthen. All of the many beings who showed up for us, extending kindness and care. All of that as nourishment woven within us. It's impossible to recall every single instance, but maybe highlighting some moments, experiences where we really recognize we received kindness of others. Support, care, especially through harder times. When our suffering or our distress and our difficulty was met and held. Feel and imagine the presence of all of that in the body right now. Feeling and imagining the infinite amount of compassion we've extended in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. The beings we have supported and loved, cared for. You probably have done that even today or this week. So just considering the unbelievable volume of compassion this heart and body has already extended. Feeling this body as a body of compassion. Compassion extended, compassion received. And feeling and imagining the potential of all the compassion yet to come. Compassion is sometimes described as having a boundless quality. Can we feel and sense within our body and heart and mind the boundless quality of compassion, past, present, future? Symbolically feeling and imagining this boundless quality of compassion as a golden sphere of light. 
right in front of the heart center. Imagining it like the sun with its warmth and radiance. If visualization is challenging, no problem. Imagining what it could look like in the mind's eye. And to help prepare us to invite in and lighten the load of another. Take a moment and look towards our own heart. What's here right now, today? What's causing some distress or difficulty? This could be an old and ongoing wound or hurt. This could be something not even quite in our consciousness, maybe just a heaviness, ache. And giving ourselves a moment to feel into and recognize what other distress, discomfort, dissatisfaction we might be holding. It could be helpful to see yourself in front of you, holding that with the fear or the sadness, with the frustration, the regret, Shame. And see if the heart can feel that trembling towards our own difficulty. Then with Tonglen, we invite this difficulty or challenge, this pain or ache, we invite it to be like a little cloud of dark smoke hovering in front of the belly button line. So imagine pouring out some of this difficulty and challenge, visualizing it there. And feeling the radiance and warmth at the heart, we then use our breath to transform this challenge and difficulty. So with the inhale, drawing in these dark tendrils of smoke just towards that radiant light in front of the heart. And exhale, may I be free from suffering. May I know peace and ease. May I experience love and belonging. And giving ourselves a moment here, whether it feels very full of emotion, whether it feels just like words, to let ourselves focus, practice, and dedicate our attention holding our own difficulties and inviting that transformative breath at the heart. Once again, making real, clear and blatant whatever difficulty we're holding today and feeling that beautiful intention to hold it with ourselves, to hold it with our heart. Seeing it as that dark cloud of smoke. And with the inhale, drawing it up to the sun, like the sun radiating and cutting through the cloud. And exhale, extending that aspiration. May I be free from suffering. May I know peace and ease. May I have love and belonging. And 
we may not be able to get rid of the source of this pain, can we, through this compassionate aspiration, start to dissipate some of the extra suffering? A couple more breaths here, drawing in that little cloud of smoke, exhale, radiating. One more last breath, drawing in those very last tendrils to the warmth of the heart. And exhale. Returning to the body, noticing sensations in the body, reconnecting to that core essence of love in the heart. remembering that bigger view of our compassion. So much bigger than today. So much greater than we can even fathom all the compassion received, all the compassion extended. And then allowing ourselves to bring to mind a person or persons who are struggling and suffering bringing them vividly to mind, their challenges and difficulties. Feeling the tug at the heart so longs for them to be more free. And turning towards that difficulty with our open heart. And feeling and imagining that some of this difficulty could be poured out, that we could lighten the load, we could offer our own heart to catch this difficulty in that little swirling cloud of smoke. Really riding the energy of the natural compassion to alleviate suffering. Sensing, recognizing the pain that is held in that little cloud. With our inhale, drawing it in, up towards that heart. Exhale, radiating, burning off. May you be more free. May you know peace and ease. May you experience love and belonging. And as you extend, really feel and imagine the possibility. You feel the desire, the wish to liberate this being. A couple more breaths here, drawing in keeping this person vividly in mind, extending out. This boundless compassion in all directions. May you be more free from suffering. May you know peace and ease. May you experience love and belonging.
And bringing in those last little tendrils, and extending them out. It's clear, radiant love and light. Letting go of the words and the concepts. And returning to just this body and this breath. Feeling and imagining this body and breath infused with compassion. Feeling your very awareness infused with compassion. For just a couple moments, resting in this greater field of awareness infused with compassion. Whatever arises can simply come and go like a passing wave. As we rest in that greater space all around, Thank you for your practice. Everybody run to the exits. Just kidding. <laughs> a little too much compassion. <clears throat> so before we get into the content tonight, just love to hear from folks any questions or reflections on that practice. Just a little different from our compassion practice last week. And if you weren't here last week, it was totally different since it was new. Yeah, so any questions or reflections on, uh, yeah, practice of Tonglen, either friends here or online? Before that, I forgot an important aspect of our, our time here at the collective as a beautiful community that kind of comes together and arises in a unique configuration every week. It's really important that every week we're kind of recommitting to the entire time we're here together as practice. So when we are practicing, that's the most obvious moment when we're doing compassion, but also as we're listening and speaking, really to do mindful listening mindful speech with one another infused with compassion to allow folks to be able to share in a way that can feel authentic and held it's really hard to do 
but really try to track even your thoughts and judgments as other people are speaking or you are speaking. That uh, an important aspect of our ever emerging freshly community. So with that, any questions, comments, reflections? Yes. I really appreciated the um, <clears throat> the physicality of breathing in through the belly and breathing out the, I guess, golden light processed <laughs> feelings. <laughs> yeah. And I, I hadn't experienced that before. It's always like goes in, comes back out. Mm. This this felt this felt powerful, mm. um, and I've played with practices like that before, and I find it so powerful to feel the direct interruption. Mm. I had completely accidentally discovered that something that worked for me was feeling the distraction of my phone mm -hmm. to my brain. I could like catch it. Sometimes I'd literally physicalizing it, mm. and I was just so curious about that the belly and why, or if not why, then just if you could say a little bit more about what it means for the, the imagery and for it to come through there. Yeah, um, great question. It's supposed to be a little in front of the belly. So, at, and I, it makes sense that you would feel it in the belly. Same with the heart. They're supposed to be kind of in front, but for most people they do experience it inside. Yeah. And Part of the reason in front, you know, some of the traditional teachings, you really are like breathing it right in. And that can give some people um, a sense of existential terror. Like, I don't wanna breathe that in here. Like, I don't want that black smoke in here. And there's like a real aversion. There's no, there's nothing wrong about it, especially if that feels natural and doesn't, like is not upsetting. Um, to your other question, man, I mean, <laughs> there's like a, maybe contemporary scientific point of view on why the belly center might be such an important area for us to work with, right? We have more neurons here than in our brain. So it is a feeling center. You know, what can we do with that feeling center? A lot, right? There is so much we're actually experiencing kind of in the gut. And so to bring to mind and imagine an experience in, <clears throat> in the belly center, we might actually, you know, be drawing some attention and awareness to what's always already there. And there's a reason we call it like, I had a gut feeling. Mm -hmm. When we experience emotion, like most of it is either here or here, heart or gut. So by evoking compassion, which can bring forth um, kind of feelingfulness and emotions, it makes sense that there's like a materiality feeling to it in the belly. That wouldn't be if you were like breathing it into the shoulder or to the foot, right? Just not, that wouldn't be there because there literally is a feeling center. Um, and then from, you know, our ancient technologies, um, so many wisdom traditions, you know, the root chakra or the three chakras down here, there's a lot of vital energy, right? And um, I think it's a really interesting area to feel grounded. That's mm -hmm. often what you hear in, um, you know, certain practices where we're really trying to feel like the mountain and the base of the mountain, there's a stability in the belly when we practice that's different than the heart or the crown. There's just like a groundedness. And I, I would say if there is a sense that it is kind of powerful and stabilizing, like stay there, you know, irrespective of this practice, you know, we can always do belly breath practices to have that stable grounded energy. Well, and I appreciated letting the those thoughts be as far away from up here as possible. That's like kind of as far away as they can go without right. being in the knees. Although right. I will try that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. Just a realization that um, in the beginning, you said, you know, we're going to do a, a compassion practice for ourselves and for others. A lot easier for, for me to do it for others. And I realized, like, wow, when I turn on myself, it's um, 
a little bit more difficult. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so I was just, hmm, noticed that. Yeah. And difficult in even imagining something or difficult in the feeling? Like what? I'm just curious. In the feeling. So it's, for me, it's just like, I just thought the way I noticed how my body felt. Yeah. And I mean, for me, it makes sense thinking about it. Yeah. Um, why I'm like that. Yeah. But it was just interesting that I, I just noticed it. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. But yeah. Who else felt that it was easier for others than for oneself? Yeah. I mean, I think it can depend if you're, if you deem yourself as having something truly fucked up happening. <laughs> like maybe there's like a little more at the surface availability, you know? Um, yeah, it really can be. And especially like I had like a exceedingly mundane day, which is like pretty great. Um, <laughs> but I think really it's just fine. Like just getting stuff done. Um, and I was like, was I suffering? Like, how was I suffering today? <laughs> and it's like, well, there's always something, you know, like there's always something, but it can be a little less uh, vibrant than other days where it feels very blatant, you know, like, oh, I'm so tired or I'm so stressed or I'm so angry. Like that can make it feel more kind of palpable. And I think it's, 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 it is good to try and practice it even with like just the day-to-day -day mundane of being a human who's going to get old and die and around all other people we love who will also get, you know, like just that reality of um, the basic condition of suffering, um, not as a bummer, but as a like, how do we, how do we like hold ourselves that way too? Um, and you know, that kind of other common question, like, can you really have compassion for others if you can't have it for yourself? Yeah. Is it sustainable? Like, no. <laughs> so it's, it is, you know, how do we sustain that for others? And that's what I love about like the intention. I was talking with a colleague today, you know, in the field of um, mental health and well-being, like the big key that people are always wanting to um, understand is how do we get people to change behaviors? And that's like, we all know what to do. Like you can Google improve your mental health and well-being. And there's like so many options, right? So then, well, how do we actually catalyze? And it's very often associated with our motivation, our intention, our aspiration would be the um, more contemplative way of saying it. Like what actually makes us do that change, that like extra effort? I mean, there's also the question of what gets in the way, but that's a, a, an aside. And like what makes us do it is like if we feel really aligned with that motivation and aspiration. So if like we really feel that call of man I just sending compassion to others feels so right like it's so the thing. Then how does that motivate us, I guess I got to work on myself too, so I can keep doing it, you know like what's the way that we create the motivation to help us you know, engage in these shifts, like these shifts of our natural behaviors or natural ways of, of being in the world. Yeah. Yes. Um, there was a meta practice that a mini one that I did today in, in the car park <laughs> right before going into work. <laughs> so, um, and but the the format of it was starting with um, a person that's easy to love yeah. and then um, holding that person in their mind and then having them say it to you mm. so experiencing that same it's hard that that same hardness of it's easier to do for others and, and but having it reflected back on you from yeah beautiful was really I don't know it helped that shift because if my, you know, if my daughter or my husband were saying it to me, I'd be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but for me, saying it to myself is much harder. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Eve. Hi. <laughs> um, I had a hard time visualizing the warm, radiant, yellow ball of compassion. Mm. And that made me sad. Mm. Um, because man, when I'm on psychedelics, it is great. <laughs> like it's easy to access. I'm like in it. I am it. Yeah. 
but you know, just in waking everyday life, yeah, it felt um, I don't know, like felt hard to access, mm -hmm. and I was trying, and um, yeah, it made me sad. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, and yeah, and I think you know the sadness makes sense to be like, mm -hmm. wow, like I know that I that this is part of me. I know it's there. Like, why won't it? shine or show um and i'm curious because you know i think there are many sometimes in meditation we almost get like performance anxiety a little you know it's like oh my god i gotta do this thing right now and um whereas that sense of love at the heart it actually might have been present many times today without trying and so it can be really nice to notice when throughout the day am i experiencing that sense of my heart that feels full of love and that there is a when i'm using love and compassion here interchangeably i know they are different uh, but there's so much overlap and you know i think those words we can use them quite differently semantically but i i know for myself like when you see something that really like squeezes the heart and there's something that rises up that feels a desire for kindness right like then we can in that if we want to in that moment like oh that's what that that's what that golden sphere or orb would be like that's what that sun would feel like so then when we go into practice maybe there's like a little more availability but it makes sense i mean i think visualization especially can be really tricky for people it's not always that apparent i do think it's really tender to look at the sadness too you know and you know be like it's Compassion is one of those practices, whatever arises, you direct compassion towards it. So if there's no golden orb, compassionate towards the lack of golden orb. If there's sadness, compassion towards this, like, doesn't matter anything that arises, you can kind of direct towards it. And, you know, being able to touch our sadness is so actually precious too, and can be so abstract. Um, so I think there's a, yeah, there's an opportunity, if even the lack of feeling it can bring forth the fullness of heart. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, let me know if you find the natural radiances at another time. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, the first time I did Tonglen, Tong Len, I was on a long drive and listening to an audio book, and I got very sick at the end of the drive and I was like fuck this practice <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> just breathing in blackness and it's like it made me sick uh, <laughs> you're talking about the existential terror it's like okay I'm doing this I'm breathing in the darkness and sending out light and yeah. then got totally sick yeah um I eventually got over it but it took me a while to come back to the per yeah. <laughs> to, to, to the practice um, but then I started integrating it into my yoga practice. Mm. Um, there's actually a sequence that I think Scott Blossom came up with, mm. Chandra's mm. husband, yeah. um, that has a lot of movement in it, mm -hmm. where you're just moving your hands like this yes. and like that, and like, and that doesn't specifically talk about Tonglen, yeah. but you know, I learned the sequence and yeah. kind of combined it with with Tonglen. Yeah. And there's something about the movement that makes the visualization easier. Mm. Um, and it's just a really cool way of practicing. I love that. Yeah. And I do, you know, it is interesting that idea of like actually moving the energy so it can feel a little less stuck in us. Or you could imagine drawing it or journaling it or right. Like, and I, you know, you were saying it's not exactly Tonglen, you know, but like. Well, I mean, that's not the way that you it, right. Just you know, like movements. Yeah, and, yeah, and that's like the shadow yoga. The shadow. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. it's all Tonglen, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, or like there's a there's a way this like how do we? So many practices are about turning towards what's difficult and transmuting. So I think um, there is like a through thread. Um, that's so beautiful. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yes. Well, if there's anything that I've sort of realized is that all of this stuff takes a long time. Mm -hmm. I have to be really patient 
with um, any expectations I have for fruits of the practice, you know, and just sort of, and lately with this compassion for myself, mm -hmm. last week and this week and, and previous to that, when, when we were, we were doing like the confession stuff, and we were working with those areas where we're stuck. And I was, you know, having compassion for, for that, for those places where I'm stuck, where, where behavior that's unskillful, attitudes that's, that are unskillful. And that's really where I suffer. Mm -hmm. So this evening when we, when we started focusing compassion, when I started focusing compassion towards myself in the, in the practice, um, again, it, it was the, um, focusing on those areas where I'm stuck because that's where I suffer. And lately, what I've been finding, and this is like, it hit me really heavy yesterday. I was just going through my day. I had this moment of, you're such a funny guy. You're, this is so silly. This is so, and that is miles and miles better then you're such a fucking asshole, <laughs> you know, which, which has been, there's been decades of that. Yeah. And now it's sort of evolving into, you're, you're kind of ridiculous. Yes. And that's, that's, that's progress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Laughing at ourselves is like it. It really is. There's a lot of kindness in it. And I think, you know, it's interesting too, is sometimes with these practices, like with Tonglen or, or other ones, for some of us, the first time we practice, it's like coming home and it's just right there, but it's not the same for everyone. And I've heard, um, I can't remember, it was Igor Kontrol Rinteche or someone, you know, these great teachers, like there's a reason there's 10,000 practices, at least one of them will work for you, you know? And it's like, okay. So to, to also, you know, we all can improve and like these are trainable, um, but that some of them might, you know, just come easier and, and some of them might take a long time. So I appreciate that um, reminder too. Wonderful. So we're going to get into some of our content here tonight. Beautiful that it is. It's like it's the first chapter I really want to like skip ahead. Um, so this is, uh, we're on page 53, this is the chapter on commitment, and the final chapter of preparing the ground um, here, <clears throat> yes, and it's interesting, the first practice that's described is rejoicing, um, and often we talk about that as empathetic joy, so rejoicing in, in others, and uh, what Pema describes is that, you know, this practice of, of rejoicing, it has like a twofold benefit when it comes to bodhicitta. So when we think of the four immeasurables, loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity, we think of, you know, the rejoicing, the empathetic joy. It's a very good one to help kind of lift the heart out of envy and comparison. It's very beneficial for that. It's also very good to, um, you know, help us rejoice in the goodness of others. And uh, what Pema says here is um, you can really use, like she says, who would have thought that the practice of rejoicing would be a setup for seeing our neuroses? Our usual response would be to feel that we've blown it. But for aspiring bodhisattvas, this isn't the case because our intention is to wake up so we can help others do the same. We rejoice as much in seeing where we're stuck as we rejoice in our loving kindness. And so using, you know, it's, and I like that dual approach. It's sometimes really easy to rejoice in the goodness of others, right? If we see, or like a, a friend or colleague doing what they do so well, right? Like I can imagine Belinda or Mace in their settings, schools with students, with trainees, like offering their compassionate hearts, that would be an easy rejoicing, right? Like that would just come naturally help expand the heart, kind of that aspect. 
but let's say I saw, you know, uh, a colleague um, who I felt this competitiveness with, like, oh, they're doing so well. Why don't I do that well? And I'm really happy that it's going great for them. But there's like that tug, like that pull, like that hard edge, like that that is just as beneficial for our waking up on the path. Um, so I, I, I like that being able to really um, harness both. And the verse here from Shantideva <clears throat> is, with joy I celebrate the virtue that relieves all beings from the sorrows of the states of loss and places who languish and places those who languish in the realms of bliss. And this is, it's interesting. This is like a very kind of small, um, it's only three verses on this rejoicing. And in this one, what he's actually like referring to uh, it's joy I celebrate the virtue that relieves all being from the sorrows of the states of loss. So there's uh, in Buddhism, what's often called these six realms. Maybe some of you heard of them. There's a kind of the God realms um, and what are considered the, the lesser realms. And that he is rejoicing here in the virtue that we have the opportunity to move different realms in different lifetimes. This is like a very... Um, meta rejoicing, not just for one person in one lifetime, but the possibility that all of us. And yeah, the I think it's interesting for just a moment. They don't talk about it, but um, in this text, but in in other texts, Chogyam Trungpa, um, Pema Chodron's teacher, says that these realms could be understood as actual places or as different psychological states, so that that makes me understand like that we could be free even in one lifetime. So the God realm, you know, sounds good, right? <laughs> it's very blissful. Uh, there's a lot of enjoyment, but also actually what happens is people in the God realm, there's this potential to get caught up in the illusion of sensory joy and attachments, right? So not actually considered to be the greatest realm for awakening. And then there's the demigod realm, which sounds like kind of the corporate world. Um, there's like anger and competition and you want to take someone down and like you're super powerful, but like you're always like, where do I find myself and where are you? So demigod realm, like just generating a lot of aversion and anger, right? Politics, Politics corporate, yeah. Is that the one where they can like see the god realm through the mm -hmm. And yeah, right? I've like worked in that place. <laughs> you know, it's like, why do they get to park there? Or like, yeah, yeah. It's like, there's like this very competitive, you know, so if the God, you know, the God realm is more like this kind of clinging and attachment, then the demigod may more the aversion. Um, and then this human realm, which, you know, I, in, in comparison is like the perfect mixture, Goldilocks style of bliss and suffering. <laughs> right, so that we actually can wake up, and and then you know these lower realms, I really struggle because one of them is the animal realm. I mean, that is not, and they and they associate. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's so clearly more awakened. Oh yeah, I mean, and even in some translations, also the plant consciousness is put in there too. So I, I, I it's weird this idea that somehow. It's just basic instinct. There's no sense of responsibility or consequence. It's kind of this, this very, um, you know, yeah, base realm. But we don't have to call it animal realm. We could just call it base realm. It's um, so weird because animals are here. I've seen them. Yeah, <laughs> right. Somewhere else. Yes. But our consciousness could, you know, could be in the animal realm, I guess. Yeah. And then hell realm kind of goes without saying um constant suffering and you know what's interesting is it's impossible not impossible but very hard to practice in a hell realm and i think about this you know especially in like trauma-informed meditation practices and teaching where it's like meditation is for everyone it's like really even if you don't have a roof and there's bombs going off and you know like when you're living in a hell realm like it asks, is really hard to practice for very obvious reasons. Um, as a mental state, we all pass through hell realms. 
you know, when we're experiencing great loss or aversion or pain. So just this idea, like, so it's so interesting, like I rejoice in like this essentially, with joy I celebrate the virtue that relieves all beings from the sorrows of the states of loss and places those who languish into the realms of bliss. Like I rejoice in the possibility that um, we can shift through these realms. And then the other realm um, is the realm of the hungry ghosts, right? Mm -hmm. Which man, I passed through a lot, you know, like I want it to be like this, if it was like this, I'd be so much better. Like just, I want it to be different. I'm like stuck in that way, which I also like, it's interesting because hungry ghost has this real connotation to like, you know, the small mouth and the huge stomach and no ability to fill it. Um, but I wonder too, if there's part, I don't know if this is hell realm or hungry ghosts realm, when you get stuck in blame, mm -hmm. which is such a trap um, of, you know, that kind of victimization and blaming the other and the outside world and everything is happening to me, that feels like a hungry ghost realm too, in that you're trapped um, and you can't move. So we can rejoice <clears throat> in the kind of movability of these six realms. Just want to spend a moment because I think they're kind of interesting. Yes, the so-called base um, realm, there's not attributed any intelligence, any morality, any ethics in the base realm. So you're really acting out of pure instinct. Yeah. Animal desire. Animal desire. So I don't want to put down animals in that way. Yeah. Um, did you, what's the difference between the hell realm and the... Um... Hungry ghost? Yeah. Yeah, I think with the... I think you can be a hungry ghost and like be essentially living in like a God realm. If that makes sense. Oh. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm just really it's riffing. Realm? Hungry ghost realm. Yeah. Is it, is, is it traditionally depicted below the hell realm? I think it is. Yeah. I know. I was looking at. I have one of the. Yeah. I have one of the. There's the these beautiful. I was almost gonna bring it in, but I. It's, awkward to bike with it <clears throat> like the <laughs> these beautiful tonka paintings where you get to see all the realms um visually yeah and so with like what i think of the hungry ghost realm or that is like really like you just nothing will satisfy you whereas the hell realm like you're really like there's so much suffering like blatant kind of external suffering yeah good question yeah so then yeah, and so I think, I think this idea that we can rejoice even in moving through the realms, and you know, this brings up an interesting point. Again, often Pema Chodron is inserting ideas into this text that aren't there, which I'm really into because they're good points. Um, and she's saying, you know, this idea, this virtue, like what allows us to move between the six realms are these, you know, and she says it's when we fully accept that the actions of our body, speech, and mind have pleasant or unpleasant consequences, then we're actually motivated to act, speak, and think in ways that benefit rather than harm us. And she tells this beautiful little story. Um, I think it's about Jarvis Masters, but she says, I have a Buddhist friend who's an inmate at San Quentin in California. One day he was being harassed by a guard, but he did not retaliate. The other men saw this and asked him how he kept his cool. He told them that if he made the guard matter, he might go home and beat his children. This is the kind of virtuous, compassionate understanding Shantideva refers to in that opening. Like we can actually move beyond like our own simple needs and desires into like that greater understanding and that helps us move um, into, you know, out of the realms where we're full of delusion. And the next stanza is, <clears throat> and I rejoice in the virtue that creates the cause of gaining the enlightened state and celebrate the freedom won by living, by living beings from the round of pain. The intention ocean of great good that seeks to place all beings in the state of bliss and every action for the benefit of all, such is my delight and all my joy. And so in that, first um, stanza there, and I rejoice in virtue that creates the cause of gaining enlightened state. So 
the virtue of actually recognizing the law of karma, like le recognizing the um, ways in which our actions and behaviors can cause harm, like Jarvis, maybe Jarvis Master sees with the, the prison guard. <clears throat> and then doo -doo -doo, the intention of great good that seeks to place all beings in a state of bliss. Uh, Pema writes that the ocean of great good refers to our aspiration of bodhicitta. And that when our intention to awaken for the benefit of all beings becomes our guiding principle, even emotional upheavals won't lead us astray. People who are clear about their commitment become like mountains, remaining steady even when the weather gets wild. It's important to keep this in mind and not think we can't go forward until the storms completely subside. Yeah, and I, you know, I love that image of, you know, becoming through our intention, becoming stable like the mountain. Um, and we become stable like the mountain by having such clarity in our intentions. What are we doing this for? Why are we doing it? Uh, with that aspiration, bodhicitta. So what you described, that is what I would like to learn to surrender to. Which thing? Whatever you just whatever you just said the, uh oh i said a lot of things the karma what, 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 yeah, what you read oh yeah yeah so that once the intention to awaken for the benefit of others becomes our guiding principle yes yeah, even emotional upheavals won't lead us astray thank you yeah me too yeah <laughs> yeah so tell me how <laughs> one emotion at a time um, well, no, I think Jimmy really nailed it. It's just gonna take a while. Yeah, that too. And I do think it's, you know, it is starting with the small stuff, not waiting for the big stuff. Meaning, can we, when we feel just slightly irritated, remember that we're acting for the sake of all beings, or that's our aspiration, as opposed to waiting for when, you know, we're like wrecked by rumination and worry. So to really be doing these practices. And it's so simple, like aspiration bodhicitta, we'll get there in a moment. Um, it's, you know, taking the vow, I mentioned that sounds a little heavy duty, but it's kind of renewing every single day, our contract with what's larger than us, with a heart that's greater, you know, like how do we every single day, like these, these vows, most people who take the bodhisattva vows, we say it every day sometimes multiple times a day, renewing that contract, making it feel very real, so that hopefully starts to get in there. And when we see the opportunity to kind of let it go, we let it go. Like these upheavals are a little bit less upheavals in our life. Um, uh, 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 uh. Then um, in the next stanzas, so this is kind of, those are about, you know, the delight, then the, the next stanzas here are really about um, how do we um, orient ourselves towards recognizing kind of the, the, the teachers. And, and I think about this in a lot of ways. Uh, obviously, there are wonderful enlightened teachers um, in this world who we can look to for advice and um, in some ways modeling how they are in the world. But also I see everyday regular humans acting like incredible bodhisattvas and that's kind of like calling onto them and orienting our mind towards them. So the asking the wise to illuminate our confusion overcomes wrong views. Um, so this idea that we can watch people in the way that they act in the world and that can help us, guide us towards our bodhisattva nature so in his stanza, he says, I join my hands beseeching the enlightened ones who wish to pass beyond the bonds of sorrow. Do not leave us in our ignorance, remain among us for unnumbered ages. Just this idea that without the example of people who are truly doing good, it might be hard for us to keep the hope alive that we too could be that. And you know, it, it doesn't actually take a lot to find people doing good but it does take an intention to notice and pay attention and, you know, keep them kind of in your mind. Does anybody come to mind or any behavior or recent action or activity that you've noticed? Anyone seen any bodhisattva activity? 
has been inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. I wasn't really fishing for that. But um, yeah, I thought you, you were like vigorously nodding there. No? Yeah, yes. There's no one that comes to mind. I, it's just inspiring to remember to look for that. Yeah. It's really easy to focus on not that. Yeah. yeah. And it, it brings back, it brings to mind that famous Mr. Rogers quote about looking for the helpers yeah. in any crisis. Yeah, beautiful. Right, the opposite of what we've done in the history of social psychology, like looking at the people who continue to like ramp up the shock as opposed to the people who don't do it anymore. I was thinking of Navalny, who, yeah, he gave up so much for you know, his country and everything. Yeah. Do you want to share with people who might not know? Oh, yeah. He was a Russian dissident who um, was poisoned by Putin. And then he yeah. had the courage to go back to Russia. And he was in this terrible jail. And I think he was going to be released, or yeah. at least it seemed like it. And he was murdered, but no one knows what happened exactly. And now his wife is, yeah, very much taking up the cause. Yeah. They just so selfless. I, th you know, just from what I know of them. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay. This is a lot smaller than that, um, <laughs> but I think sometimes it happens as <laughs> small. Just, um, I have, I've have, I have a newer job, and I have a boss, and this boss, like, just radically allows me to be a human being mm. and not a robot. Wow. And it's uh, radical. It's a revolution yeah. that I can say, you know what? I'm just too tired. I can't get that done today. And he's like, that's cool. Amazing. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I rejoice in that also. Yeah. Just one comment. I think it's easy to see all of the bad stuff because that's what's on the news. Yeah. And it's a little bit harder to see all of the people trying to do good stuff yeah. either. Be, you know, I have a few friends that are training to be therapists yeah. and you know, just all the people that are just doing all the work on a daily basis to help people out with addiction and mental health and homelessness. And they don't make the news, but they're there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For me, I was thinking about that actually before you asked this question, just looking around the room and hearing people, whether it's a movement practice aligned with Togland curiosity about something to understand better visualization shifting attitude to one oneself just this intentional attitude that i'm just experiencing from lots of different people here in different ways the flavors of it this attitudinal intent mm -hmm. for me that's maybe a core of a practice that is an alignment and to me that's the inspiration as i experience it here mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. beautiful yeah is there one other? Yes. Right there. Um, a close friend of mine uh, just moved to Ventura from Pacifica. Um, and he did it with such grace mm. and humility mm. and willingness to help others. Mm. And uh, he's shown up in many ways in my life, too. Mm. Um, I just. Over the, of knowing him over the last couple of years, he's just taken this huge leap of faith. Yeah. And um, kind of like Hanuman. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Yeah, Hanuman, kind of like the quintessential representation of that service, right? That like devotion and service. And, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's just really a beautiful way. And I think she says here, um, Great teachers provide our first glimpses of the expansiveness of our own minds. If they remain with us, we have living examples to remind us of our wisdom. Thus, tradition says <clears throat> practice comes, the practice overcomes the fear of remaining in ignorance and confusion forever. And there's, you know, these many practices in Buddhism to kind of call in our teachers, call in the gurus. And often the beautiful thread of that is, yeah, like they're already in us, right? Like we highlight and we see in them and then maybe recognize in ourselves the seed of that as well, which is so beautiful. Um, so then, yeah, I think I will save it for next week, but we get into dedicating the merit, which I just, I love the way it's unpacked here. Something many of us have done many times, 
Um, and the way, uh, as like a preview, uh, what Pema Trojan says is this word merit is problematic for many modern Buddhists that doing virtuous acts will make everything go smoothly for us in the future. Um, and yeah, it, it can feel like a little transactional. But she says accumulating merit depends on letting go of our possessiveness altogether. And this can't be done with like a business deal mentality. It's not like putting money into a savings account for our retirement. Merit can only be accumulated by letting go. So this, I, from this point of view, sharing merit means surrendering completely with an attitude of letting whatever happens happen. If it's better for me to have pleasure, let me have pleasure. If it's better for me to have pain, let me have pain. We aren't collecting anything for ego to hold on to. So it's, yeah, it's such a more a rich understanding of merit. Um, and this is how the vows start. So I'll, I'll read a couple and then we'll come back to them next week. I, I find them so moving. Um, for all those ailing in the world until their every sickness has been healed, may I myself become for them doctor, nurse, and medicine. Raining down a flood of food and drink, may I dispel the ills of thirst and famine. And in the ages marked by scarcity and want, may I myself appear as drink and sustenance. For sentient beings, poor and destitute, may I become a treasure ever plentiful and lie before them closely in their reach, a varied source of all they might need. My body thus and all my goods beside and all my merits gained and to be gained, I give them all away, withholding nothing to bring about the benefit of beings. It's just this, like all my possessions, all of my body, everything, you know, when you dedicate the merit, you start to really cut and thin those ties of self grasping and holding close and needing. And though it's done <clears throat> again, symbolically, the richness of the symbolic language is so, I think it can really start to transform the heart. So with that, we're gonna dedicate the merit. <laughs> How appropriate. Um, I'll share a version of these verses that I, I think really help understand the, the depth of heart aspiration. So the merit represents the energy of our practice here. And if it feels comfortable placing the hands in front of the heart as an offering. And dedicating the merit so that we can consider ourselves the possibility of being a lamp for all who need light, being island for all who need landfall, being both medicine and doctor for those who are ill. May the benefit of our practice just radiate out so that all beings of all times could feel peace and ease no relief of their suffering, have love and belonging, be free from inner and outer harm. May each and every being be completely and perfectly free. Very beautiful to be with you all. Thank you so much. Um, I know we have some announcements here. The next retreat I'm doing um, at Esalen just got listed. It's with this amazing human teacher, uh, spiritual friend, Sarah King. And it'll be a little different than what I often offer. We're gonna work on 
how we can bring loving presence and beloved community into our relationship with technology. So that's in January, just got listed on the site. So if you're interested, please look there. Um, I'm hoping to dream and scheme up some day longs here for the fall. Um, and I don't know what else. Is it you, Mace? Yeah. Thank you. I can do the Don talk if you want, because you've been doing it. Help us keep the center alive, please. Yes. Yeah. Really. Your donations are um, really deeply appreciated and needed. So, and